This is CBS Sports HQ, where we make picks. And we are going to pick every ranked college football game against the spread. Danny Cannell is coming back toward 500. He had a winning week. Chip Patterson, man, he started off hot. But old Chipper, we need to change that picture. Doesn't want <laughs> us to see that record from last week. 7-10 as we pick games against the spread and totals as well. And Chip, Chip will even dive into like crazy props, team oh, totals yeah. and all that. Yeah. Chip Patterson is there. Danny Cannell is here. I'm Chris Hassel. Uh, I, the, the very, we're going to pick the, the four ranked on rank games a little bit later in the show. We're going to save those rank games for later. We're going to start with a noon kickoff on Saturday, NC State and Clemson. I'm going to go to Chip first on this one because he's the Carolina boy. Chip, this line moved five points when it was announced that Grayson McCall was out of this game. Yeah, from a football standpoint, probably an overreaction. But the football angle that I'm looking at has nothing to do with the quarterback because it doesn't matter whether you're Grayson McCall, whether you're C.J. Bailey, whether you're Russell Wilson, Mike Glennon, Ryan Finley. If you don't have an offensive line that can make a difference, it's going to be very difficult for you to be able to operate that offense. And I think with everything I've seen from NC State is that they are really struggling. Somehow they have veteran experience that is playing worse than they had played before. And I am not sure that that's going to be able to improve improve in this spot and especially not against the Clemson defensive front that's one of the best in the ACC so the quarterback has very little to do with the way that I'm looking at this game because I think that the offense that has struggled to run the ball and struggled to protect the quarterback will still struggle to run the ball and protect the quarterback against Clemson's defense I will lay these points and I will think that NC State's defense while always under Tony Gibson has performed well in this spot you know NC State's won two out of the last three against the Tigers I think that without get, being able to get anything done offensively in Death Valley. Eventually, that group caves, and that's where we see Clemson cover this big spread. Oh, we talked so much about the quarterback. Last year, NC State beat Clemson. Let me see, check the notes. MJ Morris had 158 yards passing, and they were able to find a win. What you said there about Tony Gibson's offense is, or excuse me, defense is why I think NC State has a chance in this game. I think I'm not going to pick them to win, clearly, but that's way too many points for me. A complete overreaction and as much people are looking at the Clemson who did have an impressive performance against App State we looked and dived a little bit deeper into the film a lot of bubble fake bubble screens taking some shots down the field I am not convinced that Cade Pubnik is all of a sudden just turning into Trevor Lawrence I need to see it against this defense and when I look at CJ Bailey 6'6 190 uh, 190 pounds a little bit skinny but he can be a little bit more, more mobile in the pocket than Grayson McCall and I don't think there might not be that much drop off because McCall was struggling much mightily in the past game. I think this is a defensive slugfest. That's why I also like the under. I'll take NC State all those points in a lower scoring game. Danny, you know the last team to beat Clemson in back-to-back -back seasons? NC State? Your Florida State Seminoles oh. back 10 years ago. That was the last time Florida ah, State notched a win. The good old days. It's been a decade. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to another noon game. What a, Ohio State, what a terrible non-conference they have. They've yes. got Marshall now. They started off with Akron and Western Michigan and now Marshall. After this week, Danny, they're going to be the only team in the top 25 that has not faced a power conference team. It drives me nuts. I can't stand it. I hold it against them when I do my top 12 rankings every Sunday, and they get upset. I'm like, well, play somebody with a pulse. You guys look awesome, but you've played against nobody. So here's the thing. In this game specifically, I got a lot of underdogs because there's just too many daggum points out there, which is scary when you're going against some of these freight trains that look like absolute behemoths out there, and Ohio State is one of them. But I do think Marshall has a chance in this one. A.J. Turner, their running back, has been off to a solid start. Maybe they can keep the ball away. And one of these days, I do think Ohio State maybe gets a little bit flat, looking ahead, coming off a bye. Maybe they're a little bit lackluster, finding their rhythm again. So I'm going to take all the those points 39 and a half points against the Buckeyes I don't love it but I feel like I have to oh here now you're going to love half your two for one special because part of the under is that you're relying on uh, that Ohio State defense, right? You know, you're relying on the silver bullets to come out there and put the clamps on them because this Ohio State defense is led by veterans. That is where you do have the continuity that you don't have on offense. And that's why when I'm looking at this big old spread, I am only trusting Ohio State's defense, which is why my best bet for this game, Marshall team total under six 
and a half. That's right, the thundering herd. You won't get inside the end zone, not against this Ohio State team. Let's look at Marshall's offense against Virginia Tech. Just 278 yards of offense and only 14 points. And gentlemen, we are leveling up in tiers when we go from Virginia Tech's defense, solid, to Ohio State's defense, which may be one of the best in the entire country. So you're coming out of a way too early off week. You know, maybe the offense is tries to get a little too cute. Maybe it's not crisp. Sure, but I'll tell you what ain't going to happen. That's Marshall scoring a touchdown. We go herd team total under. Really weird spot in the schedule because we've seen some some great games and and now we just have all these teams going out of conference in big numbers. Here's another one. Iowa State, you saw them on CBS a couple of weeks ago, beat Iowa at the Horn. They're ranked number 20 in the country now. They come off a bye, and they're laying 21 and a half at home against Arkansas State. After that game, I saw Anthony Beck, Rocco Beck's dad, post a photo, and I said, hey, man, you have to be one proud papa. Your son's playing awesome, and he is playing really good. And he kind of called me and said, hey, why don't you get on board? Because I was maybe not quite as high on the Cyclones as everybody else, and hopefully he's not watching this one, because I'm going to go ahead and take Arkansas State in those points. I just don't know if I'm at a place now with Iowa State to lay three touchdowns. I think they win the game, but Arkansas State is a team that showed some fight against Michigan. They played some teams pretty tough. I think they'll be able to maybe, you know, slow this game down a little bit, keep it with inside that number. It's just too many points for me for Iowa State, so I'll take the underdog here, even though it's on the road. I'll go full game total here. I'm going to go under the 51 and a half for the Arkansas State side. It, it is hard to reload that musket, especially when you are a team of Arkansas State's uh, depth and talent. And for everything that they did against Michigan, are you going to be able to go into Ames and be able to play at that level once again? Body blow, let down, whatever you want to call, I think you have to take that into consideration. Also, I think some of this is a little bit of respect for what I believe was a really impressive performance by Iowa State's defense in the second half of that comeback win against Iowa. You know, that is a group that has really been banged up, suffered a lot of injuries, especially in that linebacker room, and I just thought that they brought it with a, a level and an intensity and a focus to be able to help Iowa State climb back into and eventually win that game. So with uh, Iowa State's defense having really been challenged and answering that challenge, I expect that they'll be able to keep Arkansas State scoring low, and if you are Iowa State with the full Big 12 schedule left to play, you know, maybe you are just trying to get through this, not too worried about the final number on the scoreboard. Uh, so I'll go the full game under 51 and a half. I think our Lige Doosable is supposed to be on a call for that one. It's nice. a 2 p.m. Right, Eastern Lige. time kickoff there. Let's move to a 3.30 Eastern time kick. It's Penn State and Kent State. And the line is close to a half a hundred. It's uh, it's another uh, come get your whooping for Kent State. And Chip, you were all over it last week. Kent State lost 71 nothing at Tennessee. It was 64 nothing at halftime, something like that. And you took that Kent State team total under six and a half. It's even lower this week. <laughs> Which is why we're going Kent State team total over. A over. point and a half. You gotta be kidding me. I mean, <laughs> get you know, safety. Like, Tennessee, that <laughs> like, like Tennessee, that's one thing because what Tennessee and I, I, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the Vols this week. Tennessee's got an amazing defense. Like Tennessee's defense is phenomenal. And while Penn State's defense, you know, we think is very good. They also let Bowling Green kind of have their way with them in another game against a Mac opponent. Penn State was off last week. Look, Kent State is arguably the worst FBS team. Uh, it is really, really getting sad. But a point and a half, I mean, all we need is a fumble. You know, a fumble in field goal territory. All we need is a snap through the end zone for that safety that you're asking for, Chris. One and a half points with a spread like this and a Penn State team that's coming in from an off week with a full Big Ten schedule ahead. Let's go golden flashes over one and a half points. Wow, he's going over. All right, I'm going under on the total in the game here. You know why? Because James Franklin has a little class, something Josh Heupel does not. Going for an onside <laughs> kick up 30 to nothing. I mean, he should be investigated for bullying the opponent out there. I kid, both these coaches are class acts. But I don't think that Penn State has anywhere near the firepower that Tennessee or this sort of need to showcase it to everybody out there by getting so aggressive uh, in that situation up 30 to nothing like Tennessee 
Tennessee did. I think Penn State wins this game comfortably. I would love to see a 42-3 to outcome. That would work perfectly for both Chip and myself. Uh, we'll see if that can come true, but I'm on the under in the total. Okay, uh, those are the uh, some of the early games featuring ranked teams here. We've got the Notre Dame Fighting Irish having to play another MAC team at home this Watch upcoming out. weekend. Uh-oh. And the line virtually continuing to pick every college football ranked team uh, against the spread this week. Notre Dame taking out their frustration on Purdue last week. Riley Leonard rushed with three touchdowns, the second most in school history, as the Irish won 66-7. to But look out, another MAC team is heading to South Bend this week. Chris Hassel, Danny Cannell, and Chip Patterson, these guys are picking the games uh, against the spread. We've got Notre Dame, a 27.5 point favorite at home against Miami, Ohio. Danny, Marcus Freeman is just 2-2, two and two, straight up in his career against group of five teams. Yes, and he's got a slew of injuries starting to pile yeah. up on his offensive line. There's a couple players injured as well. I know they had a blowout performance last week, and it felt like everything was clicking against Purdue, and it's must-win game. But I am worried about those injuries. And the other thing I am worried about, too, is Riley Leonard, as good as he was with those three rushing touchdowns, and we've seen him really featured as a runner, still has zero passing touchdowns on the season. Uh, on the season. Steve Angeli, the backup, actually had a couple touchdown passes late in that game. Miami of Ohio, the one thing I've noticed about them, they have lost. They lost to Cincinnati. They've been putting up a pretty good fight. I think Notre Dame wins this game. I wish I had that 28 number so I could get that key number, but I'll go ahead and take the 27 and a half points with Miami of Ohio. I just need Brett Gabbert to stop throwing interceptions. He's got one in, in the last four games. I need him to just control it. Don't throw it to the other team. No pick sixes, and I think they can cover this number. Yeah, Miami offensively has been um, a, a little bit of a roller coaster, right? Every single time it looks like they're doing something positive, they end up hurting themselves. There's just not enough consistency there for me to be able to trust the Red Hawks. But I do think that one of the reasons they've been able to be feisty in some of these games, you know, against the likes of a Northwestern of a Cincinnati, is that like we have come to expect with Chuck Martin's crew, the Red Hawks are salty on defense. And when you're going up against a Notre Dame offense that has to replace all these pieces along the offensive line like sure I believe that Notre Dame was able to answer a lot of questions when you put a 60 burger on the board at Purdue but frankly I think that might have told us more about Purdue than it does about Notre Dame so with the additional injuries here with the fact that Notre Dame is not going to want to play a high possession game because of their depth issues and with Miami being a team that I do think is respectable defensively uh, I just think this is a great spot to be able to attack the total instead so I'll do the Notre Dame Miami Ohio under and think that the Fighting Irish just want to get out healthy and the Red Hawks can play good enough defense to be able to keep the scoring low. That would be eight straight unders for Miami Ohio, one of the longest active streaks in FBS play. Notre Dame hosts Louisville next week and Louisville kind of the forgotten team in the ACC. Everybody's talking Miami now, right? Louisville that, that's a team. Miami's got to go there, right? And they, they also get Clemson. They get Notre Dame in the non-conference. This is their first real test, though, against Georgia Tech. If I'm Jeff Prom, I'm kind of irritated, right? They played for the ACC championship game last year, lost to Florida State, and then they were just kind of an afterthought. Everybody's forgotten about them. As you mentioned, Chris, talking about other trendy teams, including Georgia Tech because of what they did to Florida State. Well, now that Florida State is 0-3 and Georgia Tech lost to Syracuse, it's like, man, how good are they? The one thing I do think, I think this Louisville team is pretty legit. They brought in Tyler Shuck, and there were always question marks, not about his ability, what he could do with the football, but what he could do if he was healthy. And he's been healthy for them. They've had a pretty balanced attack. So I'm going to say Louisville wins and covers. I know it's a big number. Scares me a little bit what Georgia Tech could do, but I'll go ahead and lay those points. I think they are playing with a chip on their shoulder, finally looking for some respect across the country. So I think they win and win big at home. Yeah, it, it's hard to know what to make of the Louisville statistical profile with the fact that they have only played two games. They haven't played anybody that represents real competition. But, you know, there is a Jeff Brom trust factor that I'm able to hand over to the Cardinals that what they're doing can translate even against uh, conference competition. So I think that Louisville's offense is going to have success against Georgia Tech's defense because while Georgia Tech's defense has taken some steps of improvement from where they were a year ago, a year ago they were dead last in the ACC 
Tennessee. So yeah, now you're about middle of the pack. But Georgia Tech is also an interesting one because of offenses in the entire country that have run 230 or more plays and scored 20 plus touchdowns. So you've run a lot of plays and you've scored a lot of touchdowns. The only three teams that meet those criteria, Tennessee, Ole Miss, and bzz, the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. I think both these teams are going to be scoring a bunch in this game, which is why I'm going to go over the total. Go back to that Syracuse game where we saw Georgia Tech take a loss. That was 31-28, 59 points. That kind of score seems right to me. So under 58, I really like that spot to go over. All right, let's move to a MAC game. It's the only group of five team in the rankings. Northern Illinois, number 23. They're laying 13 and a half at home against Buffalo. Chip, you're the Mac guy. You love the Mac. NIU's first game since that upset at Notre Dame. Let's go. Let's go, Bulls. <laughs> All right. So we've got a really, really good hangover letdown spot because Northern Illinois got another week to soak in all the love which was deserved from going in to Notre Dame Stadium, taking down the Fighting Irish, and now having multiple weeks inside the AP Top 25. I, I love that they're going to be able to celebrate that. That is cemented in history. But do you know what Buffalo was doing last week? They weren't basking in glory. They were playing UMass. There ain't nothing glorious about playing UMass. And sure enough, at halftime of that game, Buffalo found itself in a little bit of a dogfight. But then they did what good teams do. They came out of the locker room and they put their opponent away. I think Buffalo has to come out of that with a little bit of confidence uh, after a strong second half performance. And I think that Buffalo is going to end up being frisky enough to stay inside this number. So give me the Bulls plus the points. Northern Illinois, I don't think they've been in the top 25 maybe since Jordan Lynch was the quarterback and he was making a push for the Heisman Trophy Yeah, I think it's been running. 10 years, yeah. It's been a while, and now all of a sudden they're there. I think this is the last spot for a letdown for Northern Illinois. I think they're fired up. Oh, DeKalb's going to be rocking? Yeah, DeKalb's going to be rocking. You've called games there. Climb up that ladder, get up <laughs> into the press box. It's a crazy home atmosphere. I'm going to say they get it done. And Thomas Hammock, who did about every single interview he could possibly do after that Notre Dame win, and he rightfully should have, I think he might be calling Buffalo's coach after the game and giving him tips again. Here, here's how we beat you, and we mm. beat you by two touchdowns or more. Give me Northern Illinois. I'll lay those points. Okay, a little action at 3.30 Eastern on Saturday. Also, 3.30 Eastern time kick. It's the Big Ten against the SEC. UCLA at number 16 LSU. Huge number here. LSU is favored by 24 and a half. I mean, you got one team that has a quarterback that has thrown 10 touchdown passes, Garrett Nussmeyer. Another team that's thrown one touchdown pass total all season in UCLA. Yeah, I might think about taking UCLA if I didn't watch Indiana and what they did to UCLA at the Rose Bowl. I'm a little bit worried about the Deshaun Foster you know, experiment that's taking place. I think it was a comfort hire for UCLA where they had a pretty good deal on it because they've been strapped for cash after Chip Kelly left to go take the job at Ohio State. It didn't work great at the uh, Indianapolis. We saw him at the Combine. It was sort of the viral moment when he looked a little bit overwhelmed. I think the season has been overwhelming and I think playing in Baton Rouge is going to be too overwhelming for this Bruins squad so I'll lay them LSU I know there's a chance for that letdown game because they you know had an emotional win against South Carolina I just don't think UCLA is very good I love getting LSU after they were able to escape with a win I love the fact that the Tigers are going to be able to go into this week identifying all the things that went wrong and also the things that they did to be able to survive that game. And I absolutely agree that anyone who watched the Cover 3 podcast's favorite Big Ten team, Indiana, do what they did to UCLA, have any trust in the Bruins in this spot. Um, you know, Coach Foster, you can clip that. You can, you can throw it on the hype video for your team. But this LSU group is simply too much, too talented. I will lay anything up to 27 and a half with the Tigers. All the way up to 27, Chip says. Take LSU, and Danny loves it as well. 415 Eastern Time Kick, number seven, Missouri, hosting Vanderbilt. Danny, Missouri has the longest active winning streak in the country right now at seven. It's pretty impressive. Uh, Vanderbilt was not very impressive against Georgia State, losing that game. And, you know, we're wondering what it could mean for the coaching staff there with Clark Lee and our good friend Barton Simmons who's down there but I will say this I'm not completely sold on Missouri as this team that's a juggernaut like some of the other teams in the top 10 when you look at Ole Miss Tennessee they've been handling their business they did struggle somewhat last week against Boston
Boston College against a mobile quarterback in Thomas Castellanos who did make some plays against them and their offense wasn't quite as prolific as I thought they would be. I think Diego Pavia presents a little bit of a similar challenge for them. I think he could play pretty well and I know one thing I think Vanderbilt is going to go out there for a fight. Especially it's over that three touchdown number that 21 and a hook. I'll take the doors. Give me those points. Ding, ding, ding. That Diego Pavia, Thomas Castellanos connection is exactly where I went with this too, Danny. Uh, but I'm also going to identify some slow starts for Missouri on offense because Vanderbilt's defense against Missouri's offense is a big advantage for the Tigers. But the way Missouri has been starting slow makes me think that Vanderbilt can come out, keep this thing close early with Diego Pavia and his dual threat ability. So I'm just going to go in the first half. Give me Vanderbilt first half plus 11 and a half. Okay, so both like Vanderbilt chip on the first half line there, plus 11 and a half. Many more games to get to and pick with Danny and Chip, including a really interesting in-state road game for the red-hot Miami Hurricanes and Cam Ward. Will they run into a buzzsaw, though, in Tampa? Cam Ward and the Canes up to number eight in the land. Ward, the transfer from Washington State, over 1,000 passing yards in his first three games. He's second only to Jackson Dart of Ole Miss. He has 11 touchdown passes to just one pick. But tough road game this week, I think. They've got to go to Tampa to face UCF. Now, Miami's laying 16 and a half. UCF's fired up one of the biggest home games they've had. They've opened the upper deck. They town. have, and they should. Uh, you know Luther Campbell, right? Two live crew, big Miami Hurricane guy. He follows me on X, and he loves how much I've been hyping up the Hurricanes. Uh -huh. I hope he doesn't watch this segment, though, because I think this would be the spot where Miami gets tested more than any other spot this season so far. We've seen what the Florida Gators really are. They, hang in, they threw in the towel in that second half versus the Hurricanes. We saw them throwing the towel against the Aggies. There will be no throwing in the towel for the USF Bulls. And I really like Byron Brown, their quarterback, who I think is going to play with a chip on his shoulder. Remember, this is a team that took Alabama to the brink last year in this stadium. The last uh, week they took, uh, two weeks ago, they had Alabama in a really tough spot and the score is very misleading. Yeah. Uh, Alabama scored four fourth quarter touchdowns. I think this game is closer than people think. I think Miami wins, but I think it'll be a test for them. Now, they were only down five at Alabama with six to go and I apologize if I said UCF it's US USF. That's yeah, the, the Bulls. problem with these Florida teams. They want you to call FAU FIU, USF, UCF. <laughs> this is South Florida, the Bulls. That's right. U-N-D-E-R under <laughs> too many daggone points in this game let's go back to that Alabama game because what was going on like Byron Brown was there though we didn't know he was as dynamic as he was that was his freshman season low scoring game and we talk about when it was really close with Alabama it wasn't like that game was in the 30s no while this USF team operates with a lot of pace and while they play that wide open offense inherently they understand that creating more possessions in this game is is only creating more opportunities for Miami's talent advantage to show up. And so I think that this USF defense, which very sneakily has done a good job, especially in that Alabama game until things really started to break down, I, I think they're going to call on them early to try to create some disruption for a Miami team that's coming in from a week off uh, to try to make life difficult on Cam Ward they, because the upset path is total. The upset path is not winning a shootout with Cam Ward in Miami. The upset path requires all three phases to be able to be focused and dialed in. I understand based on the pace and the averages why the computer is going to spit this number out. But guess what? This computer is both based on a bunch of simulations. It ain't based in the real world because the way that USF wins this game is a lower scoring game. Too many daggone points. We go under. All right. Under the 65 and a half chip. I'm going to ping pong right back to you for a 730 kick because you're the Mac daddy it's bowling green at texas a&m bowling green played penn state within seven at beaver stadium last time out yeah, we're going with Bowling Green. We are going to take all those points because for Texas A&M, 
it's a little bit of a sandwich game. Like you just come in off playing uh, Florida in the swamp. Your next game is going to be against Arkansas down there in Jerry World. And then you've got Missouri coming up after that. I mean, if you are Mike Elko, if you are Colin Klein, if you're trying to figure out what the Marcel Reed era is going to be like, well, I think that you're really hoping that you can rely on a more basic run game, a shorter game, uh, anything that you can do to be able to get out healthy because some of the most important games of your season, if you are Texas A&M, are all going on around you, and they're not necessarily right here. Bowling Green, as you mentioned, very, very feisty against Penn State earlier this year. I think that they really only need to get us a couple of scores to get put us within a range to cover. So BG for me, I'll take Bowling Green in all the points. If I'm Mike Elko, the first thing I'm doing in the team meeting this week is I'm showing them that Penn State film and warning them about what could happen if they don't take them seriously. And I think the team responds to him. You mentioned Marcel Reed. The only thing that makes me nervous is I've been trying to see Connor Wigman. What's his status? He did take a shot, said it was a pain issue, that he might have been able to go. Ultimately, they decided to shut it down. If it's Marcel Reed. I'm laying the points. I thought he provided a spark for Colin Klein's system where he can run. He's pretty electric, threw the ball really well, too. I think AM comes in focused. I think they get it done. I think they win and cover. Okay. Although nobody pulls off the orange and brown look like Bowling Green. They wear it well. I've been 7.45 p.m. Eastern time kick. It's Georgia Southern at Ole Miss. Another name your score kind of game for the Rebels. Chip, they've outscored their opponents 168 to 9 so far. Yeah, because nine is three field goals because Ole Miss hasn't allowed a touchdown yet this year. I was watching some clips of Walter Nolan, uh, who, of course, they got from Texas A&M. He's been an absolute beast. Uh, the Rebels haven't played a very threatening offense. And, and look, I don't think Georgia Southern is a threatening offense. I know they lit up Boise State in that opener, but the very next week they only mustered 20 points against Nevada. I I'm going to go Georgia Southern team total under. We get this up at multiple touchdowns. I don't think that that happens against a defense that is yet to allow a touchdown this year. This might be the best offense they face, though. Also, Clay Helton coached. He was a quarterback coach and an offensive coordinator under Lane Kiffin, so maybe Lane Kiffin. I mean, it's kind of been this storyline of these teams just not calling off the dogs. Maybe he does in the second half. I think this has backdoor cover all over it, and one of my themes this week is fade the heavy, heavy favorites of point spreads like this, so I'll take Georgia Southern in the points. You want a heavy, heavy favorite. How about number one, Texas, Minus 44 and a half at home against Louisiana Monroe. Arch Manning likely to get the start with Quinn Ewers out with that abdominal issue. Yeah, I'm taking the points again. I know it was close to perfect for Arch Manning. It's a totally different ball game when you have to prep for it. The other team preps for you. And look, I'm not saying they're going to struggle or they don't win this game. But I do think this is an opportunity for ULM to game plan specifically for Arch. Curious to see what style they use them. Do they want to run? Oh, look, he's laughing. He's <laughs> laughing at my pick. He, oh, I love it. Bring those chuckles here. Chuckle we've got there, Chip. I'll take the 44 points and hold my nose and just say this stinks, but there's too many daggum points. I told you, fade the heavy favorites this week. <laughs> Chippy chuckles over there. <laughs> Hey, I look that that is a commitment to the principle and I am nothing if not somebody <laughs> who believes that you should stand for principles. I, I understand. Look, I, I'm gonna go Texas minus 44 and a half. I, I don't know where ULM is at from a talent and personnel perspective that where they are going to be able to score against a Texas defense that has been great against almost everybody. I mean, take the Arch Manning side out of this. The Longhorns have been feisty and, and they have really put the clamps on basically everyone. Um, you know, I, the Chipolytics make this 48.1. So 44 and a half. Sure. I'll, I'll take Texas and lay the point. I don't know. You all they're unbeaten. They beat Jackson State, Dion's former team and they beat UAB in there their second game. All right, this is a really good game. A, a matchup in the Big 12, number 13, Kansas State, late night. It's Big 12 after dark now. At BYU, Kansas State favored by seven and a half matchup of unbeaten teams. Dan. Yeah, I love this matchup. This is a really sneaky good game. Do you remember Brett Yormark, the commissioner of the Big 12 at Big 12 Media Days, was selling that this is going to be the most entertaining conference because we're going to have so many tightly contested mm -hmm. games? I think this is one of them. I know K-State has been impressive. Avery Johnson got going Friday night. They whooped up on Arizona. It is a tough place to play in Provo, to go up there at altitude. BYU off to a surprisingly strong start. I think their defense could provide some challenges if they can contain Avery Johnson's legs. So seven and a half, too many points. I'll take them. I'll lay them. Uh, this is a... I, 
obvious letdown spot 100 percent obvious letdown spot you had this massive game you played so well all three phases you know just just let arizona walk into the trap that is manhattan and now you've got to go up to provo i totally get it i just don't know if byu is the team to take advantage of a letdown spot i think if this is on a neutral field you definitely have kansas state as a double digit favorite and so if i think kansas state is a tier better than byu you right around a touchdown I think I'm willing to extend the confidence that was boosted by seeing Kansas State stop messing around and run Avery Johnson as much as possible we save the best for last our four ranked on ranked matchups coming up Chip and Danny will pick them including Oklahoma hosting Tennessee and a matchup that we used to only get in the Rose Bowl USC going to the big house to take on Michigan in their new starting quarterback it is time for Best Bets, presented by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Make every moment more. And here are your four ranked matchups this week, including one of them on CBS, USC and Michigan, 3.30 Eastern Time. But we will start the ranked matchups on Friday night in the Big Ten with an 8 p.m. kickoff in Lincoln, Nebraska. Chris Hassel, Danny Cannell, and Chip Patterson. These guys are going to pick these games against the spread. You know this is the first time Danny Nebraska has hosted a ranked matchup since Bo Pelini was the coach back in 2013. You thought they were fired up for Colorado. They were. They'll be up for this one as well. They absolutely will. Remember they ran him off for nine wins a year? Would they yeah, do for that good now? Enough. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think the scenes, I think this place is going to be absolutely electric. The light show, all of it. And I think it's going to be too much to handle for Luke Alt Altmaier, the quarterback at Illinois, and their squad coming in. He's been really good with the football. Six touchdowns, zero interceptions. And their defense has been great. They've got six interceptions. Third in the country. Only two schools have more picks than they do. But I am a believer in baby Patrick Mahomes and Dylan Riola, who emulate everything he does after that quarterback that the moment will not be too big for him. I think the defense comes up big. I think Nebraska gets it done. I think the number's begging you to take Illinois. That's a you know, top 25 team there. You got to take those. That's too many points. I'm going to lay them with the Cornhuskers. I think this game is uh, all big red. Well, if they're begging for me to take Illinois, I am more than happy to ring my bell and be charitable because I think that this is a classic case of a low total touchdown plus spread, which means that if you think that this is going to be a game that's decided with a total in the lower 40s, maybe upper 30s, well, then being able to catch anything over a touchdown is going to be a little bit of value. And I think that what Brett Bielema is going to do is to try to sustain drives to take the crowd out of the game. I mean, this is not an Illinois team that has been overwhelmingly successful running the football but Danny as you mentioned they have done a pretty good job of taking care of the football as well also if that pass defense that has baited quarterbacks into a couple of interceptions already if they can do the same to Dylan Riola they might have a chance to hang in this I do think Nebraska wins I think the home field advantage absolutely is a factor but I think that Illinois is just confident enough in what they do to do it well enough to stay with inside these numbers yeah, Big Ten West is gone, but uh, this is still kind of like a Big Ten West matchup here. It's Illinois, it's Nebraska, likely going to be low scoring. Let's go to the game on CBS, 3.30 Eastern time. Michigan has made the move. Davis Warren out, Alex Orgy in against USC. But again, Michigan, a five and a half point dog at home. The uh, cover three text thread was lit up with this one. Hey, there's a move. You better make a move fast. And we all did under. Take the under in this one. 47 and a half where it sits now. I think it's very clear the move to Alex Alex Orgy means this Michigan offense is going to be heavy, heavy ground game. Very little in the past game. They're going to want to try to make this a fist fight in a phone booth. And I'm very curious to see how USC responds. They look great against uh, LSU in that opener and then pitched a shutout against Utah State. And then they've been off. So it's been a little bit quiet. I think this uh, Michigan game keeps it close. I would kind of lean towards Michigan as the home dog, but I got burned on that one against Texas. So I'm not going to touch that. I'm just going to take the easy play and say under. So, you know, first of all, yes, 
Yes, we're taking the under. It's the smart play. USC's defense, Danton Lynn, I call him Dunder Lynn. Because what we've seen with USC is that the numbers in the market still think that this is going to be a team that goes out there, scores a bunch, can't play any defense. That's not the case at all. In fact, I was looking at you know Miller Moss and where he has his success. It's not even bombing the ball down the field. A lot of it's from inside 10 or 10 to 15 yards. It is a little bit more of a dink and dunk, put it in the skill position's hands and see if they can go make a play. Uh, and so with that, I think it is long plotting possessions for both of these teams where Michigan is going to try to test the patience of USC's defense, where USC is going to try to not make the back-breaking mistake and be able to move the ball slowly down the field. I think it is absolutely a game that plays to the under. Now, in terms of the result, I do think USC is the better football team here. I think they're the more rounded football team. I would lay those points before I would take Michigan, but this is called best bets, not leans, so we go under. All right, Chip, let's move on to a top 15 matchup in the Big 12, and this is officially a Big 12 game. We've had a lot of these <laughs> Big 12 matchups that aren't real Big 12 games because they were non-conference, not this one. Utah, Oklahoma State, and this thing is moving toward Utah. It's one and a half in favor of Utah. Some places it's two, two and a half because Cam Rising is expected to play, Danny. Yeah, he's not a bad player either. I think that's clearly why he's there. You're telling me that Alan Bowman or Cam Rising, I get to pick which quarterback I'm going to roll with, especially when Ollie Gordon has not been quite as spectacular as he was last year, especially after Oklahoma State struggled and probably should have lost against an Arkansas team at home in Stillwater. Give me Utah. Give me the Utes. I'm assuming Cam Rising is going to be unaffected by this injury. I even wonder if he could have played last week, but they wanted to give it a little bit extra time for those stitches to heal up. Give me the Utes. I think they roll in still water. I, I'm not trusting at all anything coming out of Utah. Are you kidding me? Uh, look, I think that even with Cam Rising, this is going to be a spot where Oklahoma State has a chance. This is kind of Oklahoma State Super Bowl. If you want to tell me that Mike Gundy and this offensive staff have been a little bit playing possum the, just to get ready for this, it would fit a lot of what we've seen from Oklahoma State's history where you've got some puzzling non-conference performances before they really hit the gas in conference play. This is the season for Oklahoma State. They've got Utah here. They've got Kansas State next. If the Cowboys want to hoist the championship in the Big 12, they have to be playing their best football right now. I'm going with Mike Gundy. I'm going with the paddles in T Boone Pickens Stadium. I think that while I often talk about how difficult it's going to be for Big 12 teams to go up to Salt Lake City, well, there's going to be some spots that are new spots for Utah as well. This ain't the Pac 12 anymore. That place is going to be going crazy. I'm going to go Oklahoma State at home. Those are two of the top three favorites in the Big 12, along with Kansas State. Let's go to the night game, and it's a top 15 showdown in Norman, Oklahoma. OU is more than a three point underdog at home for the first time since 1999 when Tennessee's coach was the quarterback for Oklahoma. This has some spice to it, Danny. Yes, it does. I think it's the spite bowl, and what <laughs> I'm trying to figure out is who is Mocha Joe and who is Latte Larry. That's what I'm trying to figure <laughs> who out. Who do you want to be? I don't, I don't know. I kind of want to be Latte Larry. I okay. want to be the guy with the spite that's doing it out of there. I feel like that might be Josh Heupel, so I guess I'm on the side of Mocha Joe. If you haven't watched Curb Your Enthusiasm, you have to understand these references. <laughs> but that being said, I know this line is pretty tight, and you're thinking, man, Tennessee has rolled everybody they played, including NC State and Charlie where that was one of the more impressive performances of the year. Oklahoma sputtered a little bit. They only beat Houston by two. Even Tulane last week had them a little bit on the ropes. So why is this number so small? I think it tells you got to back the Sooners. I think this place, it's the first home game in Norman, in the SEC that they've had. We do have this bad blood. And I wonder if Josh Heupel's emotions may get the best of him because he really, really does want to beat the program that sent him packing and had to take the long road to get to where he is now. The one thing that concerns me is Jackson Arnold. He can get a little bit loose with the football, but I think he'll be able to control his motions. I don't think he'll uh, be asked to do a ton in this game. I think they try to run the football, but Oklahoma's defense, is what keeps them in this game. That's why I'm going to take Oklahoma as the home dog and the under, keeping that high-powered Tennessee offense in check. Oh, no, 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 no. We look at this spread and we lay them. 
Okay, first let's talk about Tennessee. Let's play a little myth busters. Um, the things that Tennessee does really, really well, as much as I love Nico Iamaliava, I think he's one of the most talented quarterbacks in the country. They are running the football and they are playing defense about as well as anybody in the country. So it might not be that high scoring shootout. Don't hate your underplay. But I want to talk a little bit more about Oklahoma and continue to play myth busters, okay? So Oklahoma is one of only 14 teams in the country that have not trailed for a single second and among those 14 teams only Ole Miss has spent more time with the lead than Oklahoma but why do we feel so good about Ole Miss and we don't feel good about Oklahoma well because we have eyes <laughs> and because while Oklahoma has led for almost more than anybody else in the country it has never ever looked easy and you're doing it against Tulane and you're doing it against Houston and everything seems fine right everything's rosy till the Tennessee Vol come to town the step up in competition is going to expose the cracks in the foundation this Oklahoma team is thin they're banged up they have not been playing as well as their record and I think Tennessee exposes that I'll lay the points all right 730 Eastern time kick our Josh Pate will be there covering that one uh, for CBS Sports HQ guys thank you so much let's recap the best bets here from Danny and Chip and it's a lot of disagreement the only thing that they're in on is the under 47 and a half in that Michigan USC game because Michigan is going to play ground ball control and USC has a much better defense than they've had in the past. Very latest cover three podcast with the fellas is up today's episode Big Ten centric playing a little buy or sell with Indiana Nebraska Illinois and Michigan State some unbeaten teams to start the year that is the only conference this week with multiple ranked on ranked matchups one of them on CBS USC and Michigan.